I'll just show a couple of plots which sort of try and get this across. So, um, so the first one is like, say you have, um, so so the, the colors represent like maybe a treatment. So one is the treatment, blue is the treatment and cream is the control. Um, if you have one person in the treatment group and one person in the control group, you're stuffed, you can't do anything. No inference is possible because you don't have any replication. But if you have multiple people, uh, in um, the treatment group and multiple people in the control group um, out in the world here in like a wider population, that's really good because then you can use all of the easy stuff like t-tests and linear models and logistic regression. Um, also, if you like, if you if you collect from one location, say one hospital or one like spatial location, if you're in ecology, um, independent observations, you can also do inference, but then that inference, like you can do linear models or t-tests or whatever, but that inference is going to be limited to that location because that's all, that's the only place you collected data from. So, but you can still do it as long as you interpret it correctly, you can use your linear model to test or whatever. But it's actually relatively uncommon to have completely independent data. Most of the time when people collect data, they collect it in a way that has some dependence. Okay, so, um, Oh, there's a weird line through there. That's interesting. Um, so I've got these little um, these little people um, and I'm giving them a treatment. Um, so I might have a whole bunch of hospitals, for example, a whole bunch of locations. And um, some of these people are getting one treatment and some of them are getting another treatment within the same hospital. So that's a really nice setup for, um, for a study design because that tends to be a really good way to, um, like a really powerful way. So your sample size doesn't have to be as big to get as much power. So if you can get your, um, the, the variable you're interested in to vary within your clusters, which are here, the hospitals, that's like the best sort of, um, um, the best sort of design. But that's not always possible. But you do have dependence here. So you still have these clusters, these hospitals, and the, the observations within one hospital are going to be similar in lots of ways because they have the same doctors and they have they live in the same area or whatever. So there's dependence. The, 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 the people in one hospital are more similar to each other than the people in the other hospital than they are with other hospitals. And so um, you can't treat them as independent. They're not independent. You can also have this, so um, so that's in, in sort of the clustered um, way. You can have also um, the treatment vary between clusters. Sometimes this is like inevitable. Like you can't, sometimes you can't impose a treatment on a particular observation within a cluster. You have to impose it on the whole cluster. And so then you're kind of stuck with this. Um, this is okay if you have many clusters. It's not okay if you just had two. If you just had one cluster with the blues and another one with the with the oranges, you'd be back in this situation here. So where you have no replication. So even though here it, it would oopsie daisies, it would look like you have replicates, you actually wouldn't. You need more than that many, you need lots of clusters to be able to try and affect. And in some ways, the number of clusters is your sample size here. So it, the, the important thing is to get lots of clusters if your treatment is um, to the whole cluster rather than within. Now, um, this also applies, like clustering is also, it also applies to repeated measurements. So say that you uh, measure something on a person or a location repeatedly over time, that location or person is its own cluster. So repeated measurements on the same person are more similar than they are between people. So if you have that, so I've tried to plot this here, time is on the x-axis and then whatever you're measuring is on the y-axis. So um, this person here is always quite high on this measure. So it, it's kind of more similar to itself. All, the, all, the, all of those are more similar to itself than they are the other people. And so that's dependence as well. And so here I've got a situation where the treatment sort of varies within cluster, and here the, the treatment varies between clusters, between the people. This is the usual thing um, when you have repeated measurements. You generally have something like this. Okay, so that's that's some ways that like dependence can arise. Yes, did you have a question? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, 
that's kind of the most common ways that dependence can arise. Either things are like together and somehow, you know, grouped. So that's like clustered or they're repeated measurements on the same thing. Um, there are other ways that I'll talk about a bit later. Okay, so the first thing to do is not ignore the dependence. Um, you don't get to just say, oh, I'm, I'm just not going to pay any attention to that. I'm just going to pretend it is independent and just do a t-test or a linear model. So that's no good. Um, what happens is the standard errors, if you know a little bit about the output of linear models, you get the standard error of coefficients and stuff. Those are wrong. Those would be off um, if you just fit a linear model. If you, if you ignore the dependence, those things are badly calculated. Um, they might be too big or too large, depending on what, like, depending on lots of things, but partially depending on whether the treatment is within or between clusters. So um, sometimes it's too small. So the standard errors are too small, which means you get false positives. So you get significance where you shouldn't, or they might be too large. And when the standard errors are too large, that means you're going to get um, very bad power. You won't find significance where you should have. So either way, it's it's bad. So you you want to go and and do the right thing. You want to um, not ignore the dependence, and you don't know which of these you're going to get. It depends on lots of factors. Okay, so there are other things that you can use to model dependent data. Um, paired t tests are a thing that you can do that you might have heard of when you have paired data. Um, repeated measures ANOVA is another thing that people do. Both paired t-tests and repeated measures ANOVA and lots of other things that model paired data are just mixed models. They're just different ways to write down a mixed model identical in, in the way that they're mathematically calculated. So you don't have to choose, am I going to do a paired t-test or a mixed model? You're doing the same thing regardless. Um, but when you use a mixed model, you come into the world of linear models. So then you can check your assumptions really easily. If you want to control for some covariates, easy done, because you know how to do that in linear models. If you have other outcome types like counts or binary data, suddenly you don't have to have a weird other test that's not a t paired t-test for some other thing. You just do a generalized linear mixed model. It's very similar to a mixed model. Um, you could also have clusters of any size of paired t-test have to have pairs, but here you can have as many as you want, um, or you can have it unbalanced. Some people are paired, some people have five observations, that's okay. Um, or you can have lots of more complex dependents like multiple hierarchies. So you might have students within classes, within schools, within countries, that sort of stuff. So that's all possible in mixed models. Um, or you, you can also do temporal and spatial um, stuff. I'm going to teach you very few of these things today, but in the course, uh, these are all covered. Okay, so we've got some um, data which we're going to play with. Um, people were basically, you don't have to read this, people were given stimulus, so um, either white noise or like a circle flashing, and they had to press a button when they saw it. So it's just a reaction time um, task. And um, they were actually given both types of stimulus. Each person was given both types of stimulus, apparently 10 to 20 times um, per person. So it was done repeatedly. Um, so we've got this data, it's kind of in this package, so that's where we find it. So we've got a subject ID. This is really important. You're going to need to know which observation comes from which subject. Um, you need to know the outcome. In this case, it's the response time. Um, and then we have the stimulus, so is it auditory or visual? So that's not going to be what we're interested in. We also have this other covariate, which is whether a person is a musician. Um, they had to say, I'm a musician, I'm not a musician. Um, is that important? Who knows? We haven't figured it out yet. Um, by the way, ask me questions anytime. And um, my colleagues will tell me if there's something in chat. OK, so. Um, what we might do is answer this question. There's lots of questions you can ask in any one data set, but what we want to know is uh, how does reaction time differ between audio and visual stimuli? I'm not going to ask does reaction time differ. I'm going to assume that there's some difference between your visual and your, I mean, this just kind of makes sense. Um, all right, so we have to think about dependence. So each person was given both 
auditory and visual stimuli. So it's 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 a kind of repeated measures on each person. Right? The person is the cluster, and how well they do um, on audio. If they if they have a quick reaction time, they're like they're going to probably have quicker reaction times on both. Um, if they're good on audio once, then the next time you give them an audio one, they're probably also going to be good. So there's there's correlation, there's dependence in the data. Um, so um, the the identifier for the the cluster, the individual is the subject. That's that's the column that we need to identify it. Um, we also have a couple of things. We have this called group. I don't know why it's called group. It's a weird. Um, name for musician versus non-musician, but just remember called group. So each person is either a, a musician or not a musician. So it varies between subjects. Um, so where stimulus um, was both type of stimuli were given to each person, so that varies within subjects. Um, but it doesn't actually matter. So I like to think about these things because um, sometimes it matters, but in this case, it won't, it won't matter. But anyway, let's give a plot, let's, let's plot the data. Um, I've just done a box plot. I'm not super happy with my box plot. The reason is that there's no ident way to identify the clusters in this plot. Like I've plotted it as if they're on independent observations, but when you've got like many, it's this, there's possibly ways to plot your data better, but I just haven't gone there. But I just wanted to get an idea of how things looked. So I can see that um, the, the auditory um, stimulus tend to be, have, have slower reaction time, smaller reaction time, response time, smaller response time. So people respond quicker um, to auditory than they do to visual on, on average, it seems, maybe. Um, and there, there is a bit of a difference between musicians and non-musicians as well in terms of these. Um, so already I can't use a paired t-test because in a paired t-test, I wouldn't be able to control for the musician, non-musician. So I'd have to like do it separately and then who knows what you do with that. So you kind of, um, yeah, already need a mixed model for this data. Okay, so I'll go over how to do everything in R. And then I'll also do a demonstration in SPSS afterwards, which I haven't put in the slides because there's just too many screenshots. So I'll just do that and you can watch the video if you need to see it again. Okay, so <clears throat> in R, there's heat, there's a few ways to do linear mod mixed models in R. The sort of most commonly used package is called LME4, and it has a function called LMER. So you'll notice LM. LM is the function we use to do linear models. Um, LMER, we do linear mixed models. If you want to do generalized linear mixed models, then GLM will give you generalized linear models. So then you add ER for, lin for the mixed part. You can also use a package called GlimTMB. Um, the advantage it's it can sometimes be better and it's slightly more flexible. We're not gonna, I'm not gonna show you how to use it today, but I actually don't need to because it has identical syntax to LME4. So if you can use LME4, you can use GlimTMB. Um, there's also this NLME package, which if you Googled how to do mixed models in R, you might get directed to it. It's kind of in between the other two. We can do some of the things that both of them can do. Um, I don't use it very often. I, I tend to go to GlimTMB if I need to do something more. Um, more interesting, more complex. They all fit exactly the same model, um, but they do it in slightly different ways. So you can get slightly different answers, but they should all be fitting the same model. So it doesn't matter which one you use. If you're fitting the same model, you should get the same answer from all of them. Okay, so um, in both GlimTMB and LME4, the way you specify a cluster is using this, uh, you add a plus and then brackets one by cluster. And what this means is, this is this one means it's a random intercept by cluster ID. So if I look at my example, I've added a one plus subject. That means I have a random intercept for each subject. So that's what I've fitted. 
I've also got my fixed effect. So I'm interested in the group, which is the musician versus non-musician thing. And I'm interested in stimulus, which is the auditory versus visual thing. And I'm actually most interested in st stimulus. I don't really care about group at this point because um, it's just something I'm controlling for. But I, I'm interested, the, the, the research question is about stimulus versus um, auditory versus visual. So that's what I'm gonna focus on. Now, I could have included an interaction, but I didn't because it made everything more complex. But if you're interested in interactions, have a look at the interaction seminar. Um, the other note is sometimes people say, I put in a random effect for subject in, in their methods. I put in, a, I do it as well. Sometimes I write, I, I put a random effect for subject. It's a bit vague what you mean, <laughs> because sometimes when you have, a, if you want to know what, when you have a random slope, which if you don't know what that means, because I haven't told you, don't worry about it. But sometimes people say I have a random effect for time, which is actually a random slope. It just makes no sense. And so it's better to say random intercept for subject. Then it's all very clear. Uh, okay. All right. So I fit the model. How do I fit the model? It's exactly the same as, as LM, but I've got LMER and I've got this one plus subject. So everything else here is exactly the same as we're fitting a linear model. So you're just adding this little bit here and <clears throat> making LMER from the LME4 library. Okay. And then of course I want to check my assumption, all my assumptions. Um, you can just do plot of the model the, the way you do in linear models is you just do plot of the model and you get all these plots. Um, it's okay. Um, I prefer this way because the type of residual that I get, no, sorry, the type of prediction I get from here, I think is easier to interpret. Sometimes when you do this, you get um, things in the plot that aren't really relevant and it's harder to interpret them. So I prefer to do it this way, but it is a little bit more writing. Um, but then you look at it as if it was a residual plot from a linear model. So I've got here um, some, so I've, all of my factors are, all, all of my predictors are factors, right? There's like, there's two levels of um, group and there's two levels of the um, stimulus. And so it makes sense that there are four bits. It's like an ANOVA type thing. And then what I want to know is, um, is there is the variance the same? Is there is there any fan shape? I don't know. I think it's okay to be honest. I think I'm all right with this one, but it is a bit funny. And then of course you can do a normal quantile plot of the residuals as well. And here you're looking for the same same as linear models. You're just looking for the line, um, like you want it to be approximately linear, but you don't worry about it too much if you have a large sample size. You don't care. Okay, um, a couple of other checks that I like to do. Okay, so <clears throat> mixed models are actually like painful to do. Like we have all these packages that, that just pop things out and make it look really simple, but it's mathematically quite tricky to pick a mixed model well. Um, and things go wrong quite often. Um, so if you get a warning or if you get an error, you need to pay attention to that need to figure out what to do about it. Um, if you like to figure things out yourself, have a look at this uh, GLM and frequently asked questions. It has all the frequently asked questions. So I got this error, I got this thing. So it might help you talk to one of us, just don't ignore it. Uh, sometimes, very occasionally you get a warning and we'll tell you, yeah, that's fine. But often or most of the time, it's something that you need to do. Um, I also tend to check the summary um, for a couple of things just to make sure that everything is what I expect it to be. Um, so here is the summary output if I did just summary of my model object. And you can see it looks pretty much like a linear model output, but it's got extra bits. It's got this random effects bit. <clears throat> it's also got the fixed effects bit, which you would get from a linear model, but it doesn't have any p values. We'll talk about that in a second. But what I do is um, while I'm doing the model checks, so checking my residuals and stuff, I glance at this random effects thing. And I look for a couple of things. I look at this, I go number of observations 72 and subject 36. 72 groups, 
uh, sorry, 72, number of observations, 72, number of groups, 36. So I should have 36 subjects and 72 observations in my data. This surprised me when I did this, because if you read that paragraph earlier, it said that it actually they measured 10 or 10 to 20 times per subject, but that's not the data I have. So I went back and I checked my data and it's true. I have, I have actually paired data. Um, as it turns out, I didn't, I didn't actually have 10 or 20 per, per, per person. So this is how I found that out. I probably should have checked my data a bit earlier than that, but if you're collecting your own data, you should know that. So this should match what you expect. I also look at the um, standard deviations of the random effects. Often if you've done something wrong, these will be teeny, teeny, tiny numbers, like e to the minus four or eight or something. And so that's an indication that something has gone wrong in the model or something is a muck. And I would, I would always pay attention to that. Okay. Um, but I don't generally look at the summary for any inference, like p-values, confidence intervals, that kind of stuff. I just do it for the checks so that I convince myself I fit the right model. Okay, that's a typo. Um, all right, um, so p-values. Um, p-values from mixed models are pretty tricky to calculate. There's no really good way to just calculate them. Um, <laughs> and LME4 actually doesn't. So you can see that there's no p-values here, which can be frustrating because you're probably looking for p-values. I mean, I, ideally, you would not really worry too much about p-values and just look at confidence intervals. So that's what I recommend. But um, if you want p-values, there are ways to calculate them correctly, and there are ways to calculate them approximately. And so I'll show you both, and then you can do what it is you feel is best. Um, I've done some typos. So, uh, the correct way is to use what's called parametric bootstrap. This is a way of resampling from the model and then you're doing some things to calculate some p-values and also confidence intervals. Um, and if, you, if you're happy with an approximate answer, then you can use the drop one function and just ear means. Um, it can be pretty approximate. It's okay in linear mixed models if everything is balanced. So if you've got the same number of observations in each of your clusters or pretty close to it, it tends to be okay. If you've got very varying things or if you have generalized linear mixed models, I would not use the approximations for generalized linear mixed models because they're quite bad. Okay. <clears throat> so what do we do if we want a p-value for... Um, for whether or not there is a difference between the, um, the type of stimulus. Um, <clears throat> you can use the PBKR test package. And what you do is it requires you to fit a model that doesn't have stimulus in it, um, but has everything else, including that random effect that we wanted. So an easy way to do that is to use the update function. So we're going to update that model that we fitted, which has stimulus in it. And then we're going to remove stimulus. So we're going to go, this is tilde. This is like the formula. The dot says, put everything else that was in here in here. So leave everything else exactly as it was. And then I'm going to minus stimulus out. So it doesn't have stimulus anymore. And so you can see that's what's, um, and then I'm going to use the pbmodcom function to compare these two models. And you can see down here, um, this is the large model. It has group and stimulus and one by subject. And this one just has group and one by subject. So you know that the difference between these two models is this stimulus being absent. And so I'm testing for the effect of stimulus. And then this is going to be your p-value based on parametric bootstrap. So this takes on my computer about less than a minute, about 30 seconds or so. It's not too bad. It used to be like days that we had to do these things, but now it's now it's pretty good. So this will give you a correct p-value. It's a bootstrap. It's, it's good. Um, who's used a EM means package before? Yeah, okay. 
So Ian Means also relies on, on approximations by default. Um, and so if you want to get like a good estimate, oh, somebody is in chat. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're just chatting. Thank you. Um, um, so what, what do we want from EM means? We want to compare these two contrasts. So we want to compare the audio and visual to each other to see which one is higher and by how much, what's the confidence interval for their difference. And so what we'll do is we can use this parameters package to do a bootstrap of our model. So we just say bootstrap our model and we put in the model in here and that will give us a bootstrapped version of the model. Oh no, oh no, this should be response. Oh no. Okay, typo, typo, typo. This here needs to have boot. Okay, I'll, I'll fix that before I put it up. It's very important typo. <laughs> Otherwise there's no point in doing this. Okay, um, sorry about that. Um, okay, so that, if you put this boot thing in here, you will get correct bootstrap confidence intervals, although you will not get a p-value. This doesn't wanna give you a p-value, but you don't need a p-value for that. You just kind of want the confidence interval for this, um, for this interact, for this difference. Um, maybe we can. I might pull up R and just show you what that should look like. Um, okay. And you can also plot it. Now look, I did I did it this time. I put boot in here. Um, you can also, I, I always like to plot the model output using EM means it's really easy. So I'm just gonna go, well, this is my model. This is, happens to be the bootstrap version of my model. So I'm gonna use the bootstrap to do the confidence intervals. And I wanna, I wanna see what's the difference by stimulus. I of course can't see the bottom of that. Mm -hmm. So that's good. I'm pretty sure this is the um, auditory. That one was quicker. Yeah. So on average, the auditory um, stimulus was about 210, but the confidence interval is like between 190 and 230. Um, and similar thing for, for up here. So you can get the means and confidence intervals for each of your factors. And that's really nice to know. So you can compare them and look at that. Um, you also can then go back to your plot of your data and go, does that look right? Is that, um, is that, is that kind of what the data was telling me as well? Because you always want to double check that your model that you did the modeling right. And this is one way to do it by plotting the output of the model and comparing it to your raw data. If it, it was completely off, then you've done something wrong and you need to get advice. Okay, um, what about approximate? Um, you can get an approximate p-value by doing, um, just uh, using the drop one function is an easy way to do it. Um, this is, a yeah, it's approximate. It can be twice what it should be, or, or is it half? one of the other. Um, so that will give you an approximate p-value for the test. Um, you can also just use EM, um, EM means um, without the boot, and that will give you an approximate bootstrap. I'm uh, sorry, approximate uh, plot. And so, um, yeah, that's basically um, what, um, what you can get out of the model. Any questions for the R uh, before I move on to an SPSS demonstration? Yes. You said you were fitting a random piece. Yes. But I need to do one of those. Where is it? What do you mean? So you're fitting an insect for each subject. Oh, I see. Um, you can only see it in the output. Yeah. So what you do, what inside the model, what happens um, is each each subject will have its own intercept. You can export that if you really want to know what those are for each subject. Usually, it's not relevant to your research well, question. Sorry. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I, I think uh, Eve was goading me. She, you, you can't see. Um, <laughs> she said that you can't see. You said I was. She said I said I was fitting a random intercept, but she can only see like per subject. But she can only see one intercept here. 
So that's true. There is one intercept. This is kind of the average overall, the intercepts. And then each person has their own sort of intercept away from that. Um, and the easiest way I think to see that is in these sort of um, in these sort of plots. You can see like some people are high all the time, and this person would have a higher than average intercept, so it would have a positive random intercept. And then this person is lower than everyone all the time, and they would have their own lower intercept. But those are hidden inside the model. You can extract them, but um, it's not um not the usual use case although sometimes it's worth doing any other questions okay all right i'm just going to um do this in spss as well um in spss you don't get to do the parametric bootstrap so we have to use the approximation so that's the first thing but spss there's always a um something you have to give up, but you can do everything else. So the way to fit these models in SPSS is you just go to analyze. Sorry, do I need to do anything? Oh, I was probably should like plot the data first. So let's do that. We can plot the data. Um, I can just do a little box plot again here. So on the X axis, so wait, on the Y axis, I wanna put the response time. And then um, on the x-axis, I think I want the group. That's how I had it before. So I had the musicians here and the non-musicians there. So I'm going to put the group. And then I'm going to do the color by the stimulus. And then if I press OK, it will give me a very similar plot to what I had before. That's always a good idea to have a look at your data. Um, I should probably also summarize the data. Um, but I'm not going to, you can do that yourself. Um, and then I'm going to do a mixed model. So you go to mixed models and linear. Now, um, when I first do this, every time I go to SPSS to fit a mixed model, the first time I do it, I do it wrong. I'll show you what I always do wrong so that you don't also do that wrong. Um, unfortunately, it's hard to figure out that you've done something wrong. Okay. So the first thing to do, the first thing that pops up is this screen. So we're just going to fit this random intercept model, this very simple model that we just um, that we just discussed for the other one. There's much more complicated models you can fit, but this is what we're going to do. So um, the subjects, um, con conveniently, we have a, a variable called subject, but this is just your cluster variable. So it might be hospital or it might be site or something. So whatever identifies your cluster. That's what goes in there. And then we'll leave everything else as is. And we get to here. And so then we want the dependent variable. This is the same as basically any, if you fit a linear model in SPSS, part is the same. So you put your outcome up here. So that's the response time. And then I want to put um, group and stimulus in the factors. The reason that goes in the factors is just because they're categorical rather than continuous. If you had a covariate that was continuous, you would just pop it down here. It makes no difference um, in terms of the mixed model sections, the same as linear models here. Okay, so that's step two. Um, then we have to go in here and specify our fixed effects. Um, for better or worse, um, the, the default here is factorial. I'm going to choose main effects instead. Um, the reason is I don't want to fit an interaction, like I said before. So I'm going to put that. I'm going to put uh, stimulus. I could have uh, collected them both, group and stimulus in the model. So that's fine. Um, and then there's this. So that's kind of also the same as for linear models. So then there's this random bit, and this is where I always make the mistake. Um, so we're doing a random intercept. That's the simplest kind of linear mixed model. And so all we actually need to do is here, say, include intercept. I don't want to move any of these anywhere. What? Huh? 
<laughs> she, <laughs> um, then, then the thing that I forget to do is you have to then move this subject to combinations. If you don't do this, it will fit the model very happily. It will give you results very happily, but it will be completely wrong. It will not have put in random intercept. This is what I would do. Okay. Um, all right. And so that's it. We're just leaving everything else. This is variance components. That's good. Okay. Um, I think I don't need to open estimation. Um, but I will open statistics because I want to have some stuff. So parameter estimates for fixed effects would be good. Um, I think that's all I want at the moment. I don't want any of these tests. It's going to give me the stuff I want by default. And then it has an EM means. So this is kind of the same as EM means in the other one. Um, it has slightly less options. So I remember I'm not interested in group. I'm interested in stimulants. So that's what I'm going to compare in the EM means. And I'm going to click compare main effects. And then it'll give me this adjustment. And um, in this case, it doesn't matter because there's only one difference between, there's only two things. So there's only going to be one difference. So I don't have to adjust. But if you have a factor with more than two um, uh, levels, then, um, then you do need to adjust it. Um, the only really option is Bonferroni. That's kind of what you have to go with in SPSS. And then um, you go continue. You might want to compare them all pairwise or you might not. Um, that's up to you. That's a whole different tutorial. Um, and then I go continue. Ah, and then I want to save. So the same as for linear models, I need to uh, look at my residuals. So then I need to, I'm going to do the fixed predicted values. So those will be the same as I got from my R and then the residuals down here. And then I think I'm finally done. I'm going to ignore the results until I plot my residuals. So uh, I'm just going to reset this. And so first I want to do a scatter plot. And just a regular scatter plot. I want to do on the predicted values on the x axis, the residuals on the y axis. Um, and I get the same residual plot as I did before. So uh, we already talked about that. I can also do um, the normal quantile plot by going to descriptive statistics, QQ plot, and popping the residuals in here. And that will give me this normal quantile plot and this other normal quantile plot that I'm going to ignore. But this is the one I want, so that, that will match. Okay, so we're okay with the assumptions. So we've done that then we can go back up and actually try to interpret the output of our model. Um, okay, so first we want to go to the estimate of covariance parameters thing, just for the same reason as we did in R, we want to check that these aren't teeny tiny numbers. And that's one of the things like if I hadn't moved that subject thing, one of these would be zero. So I would have, that's the only way to know that I would have fit the wrong models. It's a good idea to check that these are not teeny tiny. Um, and then, um, then I'm probably done. Mm -hmm. And so then I can interpret, well, I guess in this case, mostly what I'm interested in is the pairwise comparisons between these two. And I can see, well, our visual is, is higher than auditory, has a higher mean an auditory, and that's the confidence interval for that. Um, and <clears throat> there is also this table, which will give you like an overall test. Both of these are approximate, using the approximate sort of methods. But I can see the p-values, you know, if you have an approximate method and you have this teeny tiny p-value, that's like, um, I think I can click on this and then hover. I don't know how to do that. Oh, yeah, it's 6.9 e to the minus 8. You don't really need to do a bootstrap, but it's fine. Um, 
it's you know it's not going to be eight times as big so it's okay um all right and i think that's it for spss um okay so extensions um a million of them you can do all kinds of things so you might have other counts count type uh, other outcome types like binary or counts and you just use glm er and you need a family argument the same way as glm needs a family argument so that's the only extra bit um but remember for uh glm GLMMs, generalized linear mixed models, you really want to use the bootstrap. You don't really want to rely on the proximate stuff. Uh, you can have multiple random effects. So you can you can go plus one by subject, and then you go, go plus one by hospital. So maybe you have repeated measurements of subjects within hospitals. So you can have two random effects. And what's important is that it's labeled correctly in your data. So if you have five people per hospital and you label them one to five in hospital one and then one to five in hospital two, the model's gonna think that person one in hospital one is the same as person one in hospital two, but they're not. That's a whole different person. It's just, that's how you labeled it. So you need to make sure that if, the, if, a, if something is the same, it's labeled the same. And if something is different, it's labeled different. And so if you do that, then you're safe. You don't have to worry about, there's a, this whole thing about nesting and stuff in linear mixed models, but you don't have to worry about that if you label everything correctly. And if you check your summary, you should be able to see how many of each of these things are there. And if it's wrong, um, you know, in summary, it'll tell you there, like how many of those there are. So that's a good uh, to do. You can also do, uh, spatial dependence. So if you if you do anything in space, if you sample anything in space, things close together are just more similar than things further apart because they're exposed to the same climate. They have similar socioeconomic factors. They're just they're just more similar. And so in space, you do have to take that into account. Um, there's also temporal dependence. So to some extent, we model the dependence um, between the way we model the the within person correlation. So one person is similar to themselves. Um, but what we assumed in that model actually is that um, any two observations of the same person are just as similar, but the ones closer in time tend to be more similar than the ones further away in time. And so you might have to do something extra. If you have a long time series, especially that can become so that's uh, temporal dependence. Okay, so our course, um, if you can run, check and interpret linear models in R, so do all that stuff that I just did with the residual plots and stuff, um, then you can sign up to our course. You can do this little questionnaire that uh, Eve made to make sure that you understand what you need to understand. It's uh, the first week of July. Um, and it's mostly in person. If, if you can't make it in person, let us know and we'll try and do something. Um, and then we also have another course, which is the multivariate data. This is when you have multiple responses. Um, most often in ecology, um, people have multiple species that they're measuring at the same spot, and they're like doing abundance. We have a course for that, um, which is in July, um, that Eve is with with Maeve as well. All right, that's me. Uh, questions? Oh, there are questions. Are we going to part, cover the theoretical part of generalizing in mixed model? <clears throat> absolutely not. <laughs> we are absolutely not going to cover the theoretical part of anything in this course, no. Um, if you want to do general, the theoretical part of generalized linear models, you need two, two courses of maths in first year and two statistics courses in second year. And then in third year, you can do theoretical generalized linear mixed models. <laughs> um, any other questions? Sylvia, we could probably direct you to some. Uh, resources as well if you want to email us. Oh, we're happy to do that. Anyone else have questions? Uh, question. Yes. 
Um, are there any rules of thumb for uh, a minimum number of observations per level of a random? There are rules of thumb. So the question is, are there rules of thumb of the minimum number of levels Observation. observations per level of random effect? So in this mm -hmm. case, uh, observations per level, I don't think there are. It's fine. How many, how many observations do you have? Because I have two here. In this one, they, each subject only has two observations. So you can even have a, if some people have two and some people have one, it usually works okay. The problem becomes when you have a small number of levels of the random effect. So if you have a small number of hospitals or a small number of people, then you might not be able to fit the model. Mathematically, it doesn't work. Any, any comments on what is just a small number of levels? Yeah, five-ish is what they tend to go with. So that's the small number of levels would be five. -ish. Anything that may, I wouldn't try with less than five, but anyway, in the five to 10 range, you would want to really check your model. Um, just make sure that you feel like the results make sense. And, clusters, yeah, number so number of yeah clusters leveled yeah. Yes, that's right. Yes, yeah, so yeah, so so the problem is that when you the number of levels of your random effects, the number of people, in, I guess, in my study, um, you have to be able to estimate a standard deviation for the, the random effects. And so you need a certain sample size to be able to do that with any accuracy. And um, yeah, with less than five, you wouldn't even try. Um, any, any other questions? These are good questions. Yeah. Can you explain to me why you expect, why you think the variance of the random effect is just important? Yeah, um, why is the variance of the random effect being small a problem? So that's, that's yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, part of the reason is that you might have just fit the model incorrectly. So you might think that you have a, cl a clustering variable, but you don't. Like you might think that there's, um, there's multiple observations per subject. So you put that in as a random effect, but it's not mm -hmm. true. And so you just kind of- But does that mean you can remove it? Yeah, that random effect is not necessary. It depends, like you need to investigate. So can you remove the random effect? So there, there's actually a number of reasons. So that's one reason. Another reason is this, um, a mixed effects model assumes there's positive dependence between within, within clusters, that things within a cluster are more similar rather than less similar. And um, if, they in, if they're if they actually close to independent, then you might have a very small variance estimate and that makes your model unstable. So in some cases, it might make sense to remove that random effect. If, if, if basically you end up, it turns out that you have independent data, um, the mixed model might not fit properly. And so then you might, have to remove it but I would always check with like a statistician before you do that or yes. read up on it. Just thinking if the hospital is at the hospital mm -hmm. and it's showing some deviation it's very small mm. so my interpretation the results suggest there might not be a clustering effect um, between hospitals. Yes. So there might be a Reasonable to do to you know to remove the, the hospital, or you can simply add a hospital as a as a fixed effect. Yeah, okay. So the the so um just to repeat the question. Um if if you're thinking of the hospital example and there's a very small variance of the hospital random yeah, effect. You yeah, you think there's a cluster by hospital. Very, very yes, highly. yes, yes. I think your interpretation is absolutely right, which was that there is not much clustering by hospital. There's the data is not indicating that that the that 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 the observations within a hospital are more similar than the observations between hospitals. Um, 
usually we still like to keep a random effect in if we can because by design of the way that the study is designed it makes sense that this would be the case but if it means that you can't fit the model and get results then I would ex exclude it and explain why I excluded it. Yeah, because you, 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 when you when you did the representation animation, you you were looking at you were checking the model mm. by looking at the random effects done in the past, mm -hmm. and if the standard deviation is very small, there is an issue. Mm. But in the you know in the case of in the case that I just mentioned, so the results is um, different to what we expect. Mm -hmm. So that give you a uh, you know, it's just that it, um, that doesn't mean it's wrong. No. It's just the, the reality doesn't meet your expectation. Yes. So yes. So, so there's two issues. One is, do you, should you put in a random effect yes. for hospital if there is not really any clustering in the yeah, data by hospital? Um, and the, the answer is yes, unless it breaks your model. Yeah, sometimes it, it will... Like you said, the, the model is not stable. Mm. You can't have these emergency conditions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in that way, it's possible to just move it. That's right. Yes. I wouldn't put it as a fixed effect. I would just remove it. Yes. Because fixed effect will cause more stability issues. Yeah. Any other questions? One in the chat. Oh, how would you account for it? Okay, so it depends. That's a good question. Um, I should have probably have thought that mentioned that. Um, I'm just going to show you this plot again. So if you're in this um, instance up here where the, the variable that you're interested in varies within your clusters, then you can put it in as a fixed effect, as long as you're not interested in comparing the hospitals, for example. If you have four hospitals and you're not interested in how the hospitals differ, you just want to account for the clustering, you can put hospital in as a fixed effect in this case. But if you have, if the, if the variable of interest, if the thing that you're interested in doesn't vary within hospital, but varies between hospitals, there's nothing you can do. You just have it's it's a bad design of a study, so you just can't. You need more more replicates of your application of the treatment. So, yeah, it, it depends on the it depends on how the clustering how how the variable of interest is is related. It's a good question. Any other questions? Okay, I think we're. Good. All right. Well, I hope to see lots of you at the course.